Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth session of the day, the first day of Peralta Online Equity Conference. Uh, I'm so excited to introduce um, the fourth session, Applying Principles of Inclusive Design and Engineering, presented by Teresa Conafri and Maura Tarnoff. Welcome, Teresa and Maura. Thank you. Uh, Hi, um, so before we listen to our wonderful presenters, I'd like to remind you a few things about the logistics. Please ensure that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking to minimize background noise. Also, please pose your questions using the chat function that will be will moderate and discuss with our presenters. And lastly, we're using uh, automated Zoom captions um, that we will edit uh, the recording and share it with you later on. At the bottom of the Zoom window, you will see a closed caption button and you will see the live transcript text underneath that button. Select to turn them on or off as you prefer. And saying that, I would like to pass the microphone to Maura and Teresa for their presentation. Thank you so much for your introduction. Hello, everybody. Um, today, we are going to be talking to you about how we are helping our engineering majors introduce um, or apply designs of inclusive inclusivity in their work. And um, we thought since it's a small group, maybe you could quickly say who you are and what your interest is in applying inclusive design in engineering. Or not? Maybe Mara will introduce herself then. Yes. Yes. So I'm I'm Mara Tarnoff, and I teach um, engineering communications at Santa Clara University. I also teach in our Lead Scholars Program for first generation students. Um, when I am not teaching engineering students, I also teach um, Shakespeare literature and social justice. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, what we plan today is to talk through some lesson ideas we have for introducing these principles to our students. So I'm going to turn over my screen so that you can see some slides and then we will have hopefully lots of time for questions afterwards. Okay, can, um, can I get a thumbs up from someone that you can see my slides? Okay, great. Okay, um, so Teresa, um, Jackie, who is not here, um, and I teach engineering communications at Santa Clara University. And one of the things that we really emphasize in our courses is the importance of thinking about your audience. Whether you are drafting a report, writing a resume, or designing a product, you need to think about who you are designing for, what their needs and preferences might be, along with the challenges they might experience. And what we want to do today is to situate this within a um, explicitly DEI and social justice context and frameworks. Um, and so some guiding questions are, how do we create content and products for diverse users? What is the relationship between engineering aesthetics and inclusive design and social justice? And also, how can aesthetic principles help us to develop more effective designs for diverse users? Next slide, please. Um, in my classes, one of the ways that I introduce um, these challenges is through the, the following example. Um, I have a son with type 1 diabetes, and so this is a really common product in our house. Um, it is a uh, Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor that individuals with type 1 diabetes use to monitor their blood glucose levels to alert them to um, highs and lows and to help keep them safe. And this is actually an insertion device that, that is used to um, insert uh, the monitor subcutaneously. And when we talk about um, and we look at this in terms of aesthetics, um, engineering design. Um, one of the things I really want to emphasize is we're talking about the idea that how something looks 
should tell you something about how it works. In other words, um, following um, architect Lewis Sullivan, the idea that form must follow function. Um, and so prior to the Dexcom you know, G6 device, um, there you had to assemble this kind of product uh, prior to insertion. It was a multi-step process, a 15 minute video that you had to watch and you had to deal with needles that were huge and often painful. What's really wonderful about this product is that there is no assembly. Um, it is just simple. You just press and click and it, the use of color contrast draws attention to what you need to press in order to operate this. And this is really important because um, most people are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when they are young. Um, next slide, please. And there are videos of young children um, on YouTube. These are images from YouTube videos doing their own insertion. Um, and it can be really empowering to be able to do this yourself. When you have type 1 diabetes, oftentimes you feel like people are constantly intervening in your body and you, know, you constantly have to check in with others. And so the ability for users, in this case, children, to be able to do more things for themselves becomes like, I think, a really empowering experience um, in independence. Um, but one thing I always want to you know, point out with my students is that um, when we're thinking about products, we also want to think about um, limitations because, you know, as wonderful as this product is, there's always going to be room for improvement. You know, one thing, to, of course, to think about is who is this designed for and who is it not designed for um, and what are some of the issues that might limit access. We talk about issues of cost. Um, if you don't have insurance, um, you know, this, this can be very, very expensive. Um, but the other issue is with um, this intersects with sustainability, um, specifically safety disposability. Um, this is a medical device with a needle in it. And technically, it should be disposed of in a sharps container. This is my sharps container. Um, this is our actual sharps container from home. And as you can see, it doesn't fit. And even if I open it up, it would be my whole sharps container. Unless you have um, an industrial size sharps container, it's not going to fit. Um, and the ones that took more time to assemble because they um, were made of all these little parts, they were actually easier to dispose of. Um, so I could just dispose of this irresponsibly, um, chuck this in the garbage, um, even though there's a big needle in there, or I could take a set of pliers and elbow grease to power the needle out. So it's not as environmentally friendly, and there are ethical issues um, related to its disposal. So, you know, this is just one example that we use to introduce um, the idea of thinking about diverse users, thinking about the ways in which a product can enhance a user's um, life quality, um, and also how thinking about diverse users can ultimately lead to more innovative designs, but also about how there's always room for improvement. Teresa, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, so thanks very much. That was a really great introduction to what we want our students to be thinking about. And Mara bring, probably brings that device into class as well. And maybe some of the students are using similar devices. So with that, we wanted to show how we could bring this uh, inclusive design aesthetics into a class. That's our first objective. And then the second is to introduce you to a seven step framework. Maybe uh, Mara can share that in the chat. And then we want to show you how we have our students work through our les lesson plan and um, some ideas they come up with. So let's get started. To introduce the topic, I show this slide to my students so that they can understand what we mean by inclusivity. We mean that inclusive design means that users don't have to do all the extra work. And so this is our framework. There are seven steps um, that is in the chat. And I'm just going to briefly go through these steps. As you look at the list, you might be thinking already that there's a lot of overlap, and there is. But for ease, this is a good way to organize the different aspects that you should be thinking about. And what we're talking about today, we've taken from a paper by Leidens, Lucina, and Noisma. 
um, you can see if you want to look that up, they also have a book uh, on, a, on that same topic. So what do we mean by listening? So anyone who's done any kind of design knows that you it's all about what your who your clients are, what they need, this kind of empathic listening. And it's also we want to stress to students it's not just about the specs. Often they get very caught up in the technical aspects, but we want them to remember the people, the local situ situation behind whatever the um, different technical spe specifications, the cost, the time constraints, and so on. Um, we like this example of where the structural constraints can make a huge difference. And so I talk with my students about the 1968 Architectural Barriers Act that led to more inclusive buildings, the ADA that we know about now. In the past, people hadn't thought about how difficult it would be for those using wheelchairs to access buildings. So that's just a very good example of structural constraints. We also talk about the human rights. We hope that our designs, that the designs that the students will be creating in the future can embrace and enhance the universal human rights, the ones that are, are familiar to everyone. We can look at the, at the universal declaration of human rights, and then we can also look at more local rights in the areas where students are designing. We also talk about increasing opportunities. Our design should allow people to do tasks that they weren't able to do before. And here is an example of the leveraged freedom chair. We know that there are all kinds of wheelchairs, that some of them, the ones that we often see around our campus, they work well on flat ground, but in other situations, the ground, there aren't very good pathways, there are lots of rock stones, they could be muddy and so on. So even though a wheelchair is a good idea, we have to think about situations where a typical wheelchair wouldn't be so helpful. And this one is very good, it uses levers. Another aspect is increasing resources. Um, this is allowing people to do something that they weren't able to do before. So here we have an example of a project. All of these are taken from um, engineering websites. This is a project that students might be interested in that shows how a basic design that uh, villagers were working with made it difficult for school children to get to school, but um, the improved design made it accessible for school children, farmers, anyone who needed to get from one side of the river to the other, regardless of what kind of weather there was. So this is a clear example and students can, all of the links that um, I would show when I'm discussing this to students, they can look them up, they can find out more about all of these projects. Another example is of, or another of our seven step framework is reducing imposed risks and harms. And I've got this example here of hand washing stations in Addis Ababa. We all know that during COVID, we were encouraged to wash our hands frequently, but what about if water isn't available? What about if we don't have soap? How are we going to stay safe during COVID or whatever else is going to come? So we encourage students to look at this example. Another is enhancing human capabilities. And often I kind of see that as the icing on the cake. We might try and achieve more of the seven step framework, but if framework, but if we are getting very far, then it's um, absolutely important that we can enhance human capabilities. So I like this uh, example here, that is a garden that Alzheimer's patients can enjoy because of its design. And again, uh, students would, could look on the, uh, look at my link and find more examples or how this is, how this is actually working. Another enhancing human capabilities, uh, I like this example here of a road. This is a road in Rochester, and you can see that it was dividing the communities. This road was rebuilt, and then um, it made it easier for people on one side of the road to access the other side of the road. And in the process of rebuilding it, the, um, the um, engineers, architects were able to come up with a lot more green spaces, and that led to community gardens, community markets and so on. But uh, one issue that we need to be careful about is the white savior complex, especially where students and our students um, are often involved in engineers without borders, where they're 
thinking about projects that um, are for overseas. And I'm going to turn this over to Mara to explain a little bit more. Yes, so thank you. Um, one um, exercise that we do in our classes is we show a senior design presentation about um, a project to build a microgrid in Benin. And we discuss with our students how to avoid um, the pitfalls of volunteerism, um, which is a symbiotic relationship between volunteers receiving cultural and technical experience and the communities receiving assistance in infrastructure development. These relationships can be mutually beneficial, but they can also lead to the perpetuation of negative stereotypes, racial bias, and the white savior complex. Um, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, the term white savior is a critical description of a white person who is depicted as liberating, rescuing, or uplifting, not, oops. Sorry. That's okay. And I have to go back, yeah. Um, in which people of color in economically underdeveloped nations that are majority non-white are denied agency and are seen as passive recipients of white benevolence. In other words, when volunteers approach a problem, um, or designers, engineers approach a problem from a position of superiority rather than partnership, assuming they know what's best for the community. So listening, you know, other aspects of the seven step process are really important to um, avoiding the white savior complex. And then this is just a very recent example. There was an article in the New York Times, Jackson, uh, 2023, and it talked about delivery apps. Uh, I thought that that would be something students were familiar with just coming out of COVID. Um, it could be a good design. It uses the latest technology. Students have used these apps to get food as uh, parents. All of us are probably familiar with these apps, but although they are technically very, uh, very um, advanced and very helpful, what are some of the unintended consequences? And one that's discussed in this article that um, I have my students think about is the issue of tipping. We all know that when we go to restaurants, we see the people who are serving us, it's easy to remember to tip them. But in the case of the delivery apps, who gets the tip? Does the deliverer get the tip? What are the consequences for the restaurant? So what seems like a good idea can be very complicated. So once I've given this example, then I have my students work in groups and I have them to I have them identify an example of good design, a current example, and make the case for its effectiveness in terms of aesthetics and inclusivity. And as Mara was saying, we all know that no design is perfect. There are always limitations. So I have them flag some of those limitations and then also come up with some possible improvements. And we, um, I asked them to go back over this seven step framework and see especially how they could make their design more inclusive. And Mara, you, uh, you've used this with your class as well. Do you want to add anything? Yes, I think um, one of the things that we really want to emphasize with students is being able to talk about these issues and apply an inclusive lens will prepare them for professional situations where they will need to speak up during the design process to catch problems a design may cause or potential biases. And I think you know, we, we've just been emphasizing the idea that applying an inclusive lens can ultimately produce more innovative solutions. Um, one thing that I have noticed is that there are new um, mammogram equipment at, um, you know, for instance, doctor's offices that I have visited and that they have been designed by women as a result of listening to women and the design of these devices um, enables women to kind of relax during the mammogram process and ultimately has been more effective at detecting certain issues. So ultimately, you know, when you are listening to users, you can ultimately design better products, you can anticipate or discover functionalities that you didn't realize. Thanks, Mara. Sorry, my uh, my mouse doesn't work very well. That's why it's a little bit jumpy. Yeah. So we've had our um, students think about these process. And I think I've, my mouse has also skipped um, a step. But once we've had them think about different projects that they could use, we um, ask them to think about how they could apply this to their senior design. So we've had the students 
discuss in um, groups some designs. And then because it's a writing class that we're teaching, we always require some writing. But I just want to go back to um, the screen that I, uh, oh, sorry, the slide that I skipped. And Is it the example slide? Yeah, the example slide. Yeah. And I need to share my screen again. Yeah, while you're doing that, I'll just mention that one of them um, that I had was VoiceThread. When we were when we were all online during lockdown, my students were creating presentations using VoiceThread. So they kind of used their own user experience with that with that particular platform to do their analysis. And uh, I was interested because my students uh, mentioned a lot about students with impaired vision. Um, there were discussions about our Braille reader or our Braille on campus signs, whether students using wheelchairs could reach them, where, where if uh, people could find them knew where to look. And then um, they also talk, talked about the stairs near our student center. Although we do have a ramp, it is a little bit tricky for students to use who are in wheelchairs. So they were very much focused on what was on campus. They also mentioned our water bottle, bottle filling stations along with other campuses. We are trying to avoid plastic waste, but students wondered if students in wheelchairs, using wheelchairs, if they would be able to access those water bottles and they thought about having some kind of prosthetic that might help them. And then there were other designs about making um, environments, local communities more friendly, more accessible using streetcars. And for those of you in California, the perennial discussion about high-speed rail, it's in our area to get from San Jose, Santa Clara to San Francisco, it's very surprising that it is quicker to drive than it is to take a train. We all hope that that will change. Another example they had was solar powered safe water systems, which connects back to what Mara was saying. All of the designs that students come up with, they have to think carefully how they fit into the local context. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes the design is very good, it works well, but when it breaks down, the parts for the water pump can't be fixed. Or sometimes there are cultural issues that maybe it's the women who are fetching the water, but the way that it's designed, it doesn't work well for what women traditionally do in those cultures. The students also mentioned too that if they are trying to design a water system, for instance, for a particular community, what works in one specific context might not work so well in another. So there are all these issues to consider. Okay, and we wanted to see what questions you had, how you might think about using a similar sort of lesson plan in your classroom, how you might get students from working in groups to writing about these ideas to coming up with their own projects. And I, I want to turn it over to Mara to see if she wanted to add anything that I, my jumpy mouse has led me to forget. I think you covered everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa and Maura. Let me remove uh, the spotlight first so that we can see our audience as well. Okay, and I've stopped sharing. Okay, there we go. Yes. Thank you so much again. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, are, is, it is this just um, the quest, end of the session? You're opening it up for questions or just? Um, yeah, because uh, we didn't get a chance for people to introduce themselves. Okay. I'm curious if other people are teaching writing intensive courses for STEM students or if they're teaching in STEM fields and how they what they think about maybe implementing some of these ideas in their own classes. And that's a great idea, Theresa, because this is a small group. So that will be wonderful to have continue the session with like uh, an informal discussion and sh uh, sharing your own practices, concerns, questions. So, yeah, let's open up the floor for questions and comments. You can also use the chat box if you don't want to be seen in the recording. Hi, um, my question is like still forming probably, so hopefully it's it's still it's clear. Um, so what I under, what I understand of what you're talking about, it's engaging students to design an experience for others, right? That's the core of it. So 
I guess where I'm stuck, um, something did come to mind where it was like, you know, something like, um, you know, giving them options. I'm in a, doing a history class. I'm an instructional designer and I'm doing a history class and, and we're trying to open up this like final level for their project for like inquiry. But I'm like, oh, that's not really like thinking about necessarily the recipients. It's, it's still like their own learning. And so I guess I'm like having trouble getting over that hump beyond kind of the more um, I don't know, the more obvious places where I can see someone is designing an experience for someone else. Um, if they're like, you know, lear learning graphic design or um, if they're, you know, doing maybe like presentation, if they're like invoked to be the teacher in some way or, but yeah, I guess I'm like, I can't quite get over this hump and I may not be thinking about it like in a whole way. Is your question about how you can, you know, get them to kind of practice this in terms of their design or as part of their research process or potentially both? Yeah, is it about the listing? Is it about um, design thinking concepts maybe? Yeah, design thinking is, is where my mind goes because, um, you know, there is this implication with history of being like a historian. You are sort of in charge of a narrative, right? Like that's that's the end goal that they get to. They take evidence and then they create a narrative. So in that, it's like, I could see how they have to consider the recipient of that narrative, mm -hmm. um, but it's still not quite, I'm like, how do, I, how do I get students to think about that? I don't know, other than design students, I guess I'm not seeing how to get students to think design thinking yet. So I think, you know, one, I don't know if this would, would help, but I think for me, this is also connected to a kind of research justice framework around, you know, how we, how we understand authority and how um, in different research contexts, whether you're trying to design something or whether you are trying to create a narrative, you know, whose perspectives are being represented and whose aren't. Um, you know, how my, the institutional context in which research is typically conducted, you know, leave out some perspectives, you know, perspectives from community members or others with, with expertise. So getting students to kind of think about, um, you know, you can apply the seven step framework, I think, to helping students to think about a research context or the kinds of narratives they are creating. It doesn't necessarily have to be a user experience, but they can also think about um, the audience, you know, if you're if you're envisioning the audience um, that they are trying to share with with fellow students, how can they kind of create the work that they're doing that, that is going to meet um, the needs of, you know, the classroom community? Yeah, I guess to follow on for that, I would ask them to think about the many different perspectives. Whose frame of reference do they need to consider? What are the different perspectives? Got a little peek at my forehead there. Um, hit the wrong unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, that's I, I hear that. OK, cool. Um, and also something you said about um, just remembering like the fellow students as being like a valid audience to consider, even if it doesn't go beyond that. Like that's, I think, really good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, like I, I had an assignment where I had students create YouTube videos. I said, you know, you watch we all watch YouTube videos to learn about different content. You know, this is this is a technology for knowledge production. Now I want you to use that in terms of this class. So that could be a kind of framework. And then to think about some of the affordances, the limitations associated with that. Yeah, that reminds me of another assignment where we have where students look at how science or scientists are portrayed in the media. They can go back, it can be as recent or it can be further back in history as they want, but they are looking at different depictions. I guess it's a little bit more about that. So some of the students, they focus more on um, the content, how AI is often the villain in movies, for example. But I noticed that my um, less represented students, they tend to talk about identity. When they're given the choice, they talk about how scientists and um, those working in STEM, how they're portrayed. Are they mostly men? Are they mostly white? If there are women or um, Asian or other students, Hispanic students, how are they portrayed? What roles do they have in media depicting scientists or STEM? 
STEM characters. Yeah, that's that's uh, um, your spidey senses are right on because that is part of like the construct of the final inquiries to like go find representations in media of like some kind of historical period or event and then analyze it right um, based on you know what what evidence you can find. So thank you. Cool. We'd love I'm to also, hear. Yes. Oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Casey. I was just saying, I'm also checking the chat box. I don't see any questions, but again, feel free to unmute yourself if you have more questions. Casey, please go ahead. Oh, I'm all set. <laughs> that was great. Thank you for your discussion there. I was going to say uh, something that we've been dealing with, I'm sure everybody else has, chat GPT uh, in terms of inclusivity and how we can use that in the classroom maybe on your campuses initially on our campuses there was a little bit of fear maybe I don't know Mara, if you would agree with that are students going to be cheating are they going to be plagiarizing but some of us um, myself included we've decided it it's better to incorporate chat GPT into our classes uh, it's there to stay so why not use it why not have students working with it in our classes, discussing it, talking about the um, affordances and constraints being very straightforward. And to be honest, ChatGPT scares me a little bit too. Like when I first explored ChatGPT, I said, wow, the world will not be the same anymore. <laughs> especially for students and I'm teaching uh for example advanced reading and writing and I was like reading and writing so how how can we you know rather than just don't do it don't do it like don't use chat to be how can we make sure they're using it wisely so uh that's a great point Teresa so we have a lot to learn as instructors right <laughs> and I think Mara you were um having students look at inclusivity in, in terms of when they're asked, uh, when they make a query about a, a scientist, what pops up? Yes, so I, um, a few years ago, I had some students who were working on computational creativity and they went on to work on the problem of brilliance bias in GPT-3. And one of the things that they and um, the professors that they were working with found is that representations of, of brilliance tended to be associated with with men and you know there was a kind of gendering of that and we've um, played around with having um, students, you know, write write a story about a certain quality and kind of seeing the gendered associations that that come up with that, um, so they can kind of understand how ChatGPT kind of draws on this broader internet landscape and how that might impact and perpetuate the representation of identity. This also kind of ties into our discussion of other issues with AI. I think it's important for students to know that you know, these technologies are not value neutral and to kind of understand the way that they can perpetuate bias. But I, I've also, we've also been using chat GPT in, um, in our classes to help, for instance, students to think about their research topics to, um, you know, use them to help us identify, um, you know, if you ask chat GPT, for instance, to summarize current developments in research around a certain topic, students can then evaluate the results. And what the engineering students were finding is that it did actually sometimes help them to identify subtopics. What they found is, is that, that ChatGPT was not very good at writing for a technical audience. So they were able to find that it was not going to cut it when it came to the writing needs that they had to do in the class. And it was important for us to have that conversation kind of right at the front. Yeah, so following on from that, I've had um, ChatGPT um, used in my class to help with brainstorming. But first I have the students do their own brainstorming. I ask them to come up with their own ideas. They can write down headings or they can do mind maps, something like that. And then they can ask the same question, the same research, research topic uh, using ChatGPT and see what comes up and then compare and contrast both. And often that leads to um, exploring avenues they hadn't thought of or resisting some of what ChatGPT suggests. I think that would work for you as well, Dina. 
These are great ideas. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has tried any other, uh, I, uh, you know, practices with artificial intelligence, but please share if you have any other ideas. It's quite new though, right? Like we're still exploring what can be done, what can be done with ChatGPT, but thanks for sharing. Okay. If you don't have any other questions or concerns or comments, so we can we can end the session here. I would like to thank again Maura and Teresa. Thank you so much for sharing your practices. Um, and you can find the recording in our YouTube channel that I shared in the chat box. So um, if you would like to go back and watch the recording again. I'm hoping uh, all the recordings will be uploaded in a week or so in our YouTube channel. So feel free to go back. And also, Mara and Teresa, if you follow our channel, if you subscribe, you can also see any comments or questions coming up under the uh, under your recording so that you can continue that conversation there. But thank you so much again for everyone joining. Our next session will start in uh, sorry at 11. So we hope to see you there. And take care. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dylan. Thank you so much. Thank you.